Doc, uh, February 1st has come and gone. Uh, I know that uh, we had uh, had the Physician Advisor Group uh, Chair Dr. Nathaniel Berg on, and he said, with a little luck, uh, the surge will be over by the 1st. Uh, we kind of joked about that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but, Doc, I mean, just looking at you uh, this morning, seeing the numbers, I'm pretty sure that uh, it's very easy to feel kind of defeated for those on the front lines. Um, we just have to to kind of um, uh, really um, take a step back and, and regroup and uh, and um, stand up and fight again, uh, Chris. I mean, this um, it's going to be another four to five weeks or so at least on this Omicron surge. So we uh, cannot give up yet. You know, I think that's a, that's a part where we just have to. Um, all of us have to play an effort and try to curb this surge and and at least um, you know, still practice a three W and 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 do the best you can not to um, to uh, go to gathering that thing. But I think people are sometimes uh, um, kind of tired this pandemic already. So um, uh, I still see a lot of gathering during the weekend and the weekday. So uh, we're going to be here for for a little while. Another four or five weeks or so of this high number. Doc, what would you make of that study? Uh, we haven't had to ask you or caught up uh, with you about that uh, dead on arrival study that the CDC had come out um, uh, to do. So they completed the study, and wow, no brainer. I mean, I think anybody would have figured out that, uh, you know, most of these people were poor, right? Uh, no insurance, unvaccinated, um, Really just a sad story, but I, I kind of wanted to ask, Doc, uh, did we do enough to reach out to these uh, people? You know, that study shows some, everything that we already know about uh, dead or arrival. The only thing that we should look at ourselves is that, you know, from, I know um, a certain percentage of those uh, DOA are, um, be, have been tested before positive, but um, they are also high risk, but we didn't uh, reach out to them to see if um, they need to have some type of treatment or like the monoclonal antibody treatment or uh, anyone that, that reach out to them to make sure that they check the phones also talk to them more. So I think that I know that uh, most of them are low income group. Uh, most of them have comorbidity and, and we know that. Uh, but again, what we really want to do is basically look at those people and see if, let's say they test at the fairground, they test at the clinic, uh, and uh, did anybody really reach out to them and talk to them a little bit more rather than just say that they positive only. And, and that's what we we didn't ident identify on on the on the study. You know, and we, we should, if it's not there, um, public health or someone should really look at that and see if we can do better in communicating with the patient. Doc, I mean, this isn't a, a new conversation. We've kind of been talking about this uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, that gap between uh, public health giving you that phone call, hey, you're positive, and then what? You know, what happens uh, after that? And uh, in a perfect world, uh, Doc, what should happen after public health notifies somebody that they're positive for COVID-19? Yeah, proper word is that um, Every positive will, um, we have a person, uh, is that a, a resident nurse or someone that um, knowledgeable about COVID and sit down and spend about five, 10 minutes over the phone with the patient and give all the information that the patient need and also find out to see if they have uh, high comorbidity or not. And uh, again, refer to the, to the IV infusion treatment if possible. Uh, and that's, that's the proper word. I know that as the number is in the hundreds, uh, it's impossible for them to make you know um, that many phone calls per day. But I think at the triage line, um, and I don't know if they have a digital system or not, but um, if you have a digital system, you can identify, you know, set the, a limit of um, if anyone over 55 or anyone 60 that pop positive, you can kind of um, uh, take out those, um, those criteria and, and specifically call those people only. And that's something that I'm not sure if public health have, built, have the ability or additional system that can identify the high risks um, when they enter the data for the testing. 
Uh, they should, because that's important. Because you, you don't want to call someone that 30, you know, 18, 20 year old that turned positive, but but they should be, you know, set out anyone that, you know, 55, 60 that have comorbidity that she, she want to single them out and call them and spend more time with over the phone. That's something that probably help a whole lot and cut down the DOA. Yeah, I agree, Doc. And, and we, uh, and I could just hear, kind of hear public health, maybe uh, if they're listening to this, maybe they're, they're screaming at the radio or the Facebook live saying, well, you know, what do you want us to do? We're getting 700 positives a night. Do you want us to sit there and call, you know, 700 people? And tell them what to do now that they're positive. I mean, we just don't have the resources. But I would just say that that we do have the resources because when it came to the pandemic unemployment assistance program, we saw you know the uh, Ad Loop grab people from this agency, they grab people from Revenue Tax, they grab people from all over, and they made this you know call center so that these people could assist with this huge effort. And I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, what other effort could be more important than than saving lives? So I think they could have. Uh, done something to reach yeah, out. Yeah, you know, Chris, uh, technology changed a lot, right? And that's what we had to work smarter rather than harder. Right. Yeah. Is that uh, the digital system? Uh, you know, I'd like we when we give uh, immunization to mass immunization by the end of the night, uh, by the end of the immunization clinic, we know how old the person are, and what age, you know, um, what's the male or female. So we know the data already. So that's what technology is all about. Is you have digital system that. At the end of the day, hey, you have this, how many people are positive? Uh, what is the, um, the the age group you're looking for, 60 and over? They can single those people out. And, and those are people that you need to spend more time with on the phone rather than just say you're positive. Like I say technology helps a lot, and, and they should be looking at that to kind of decrease in, in, in the um, DOA and also decrease the hospitalization. But we can interfere with them. Um, when we test them positive, we can get them to treatment as possible. That's what we do in the clinic, right? Every, every patient that high risk, we you know, we spend at least five, 10 minutes on, on the phone with them and identify, hey, you have comorbidity, let's get you to infusion center um, as soon as possible. And, and that's what um, the different clinic and the mass uh, testing is that um, we just use technology to help us on, on um, on singling those people out so can can help them cut down the risk of they they are DOA. Doc, has it gotten easier uh, with the uh, the new uh, treatment for Omicron uh, when you have someone who's high risk referring them for that? Uh, what is it like a pill treatment or something? How's that? Has it been smoothed over the whole process? Yeah, the whole process need to be smoothed out. I think they work in that process right now. You know, the Manila Man- Senior Center used to to give to people infusion um but now that with the omicron the so trovimab the one that gives the iv infusion now in place of the regenco it kind of piecemeal uh at grmc at gmh um you know so no we i think they are working on revamp the manila um, senior center and and I know we get some folks to be out there, some supply, so that way it's a lot easier for uh, um, for the provider, uh, for people to walk up and say, hey, I need the, the infusion. Um, I hope it's coming out soon, because right now, yeah, the process is a little bit more complicated um, to um, to do than to Regenco, but I think that um, uh, there's a the manpower problem and also uh, there's a supply problem on that one. So hopefully it coming up with the senior, um, uh, Manila Senior Center soon, just like before. But uh, those really cut down hospitalization. Um, I know we kind of run short of so Toby map, so um, I, I hope that it coming soon because once it runs out, um, uh, the hospitalization might go up just because we don't have the IV infusion to keep the people away from the hospital. Right, Doc. And then it, since we changed the testing criteria um, and made it more stringent, I'm assuming that all of these positives that we're getting are those people who are in this uh, this new, like, high-risk, uh, you know, people we have to keep an eye on category, right? Yeah, we, we are. You know, I mean, we at the clinic level see a lot more high-risk patients that come in. Uh, you no know, people that um, 60 years old or older that have comorbidity, um, 
And um, so we, we start seeing those people much more now in the first four weeks. So um, I think this is, it's gonna work its way to the elderly and that's what we worry about. Um, again, you know, um, this past weekend, so we have, you know, seven, eight people that we see that uh, hopefully we'll get the, the infusion this morning, uh, just because you know, there's um, parties um, anywhere that we can refer a patient to during the Saturday and Sunday. Uh, doc, uh, clinic though, are you getting a lot of uh, non-COVID uh, visits? Because I know some people are uh, just kind of catching up with, um, you know, their their health maintenance. Yeah, comorbidity, you know, for chronic care management, we're always busy, and that's the things that. Um, but now you can see an uptake on people that sick, uh, really sick, uh, on the, the the heart attack or have a stroke, or is there other problem that that non-COVID related, um, you know, so people, uh, I would encourage if you have, you know, from any type of comorbidity, to make sure that you follow up with the, the clinic uh, and don't wait too long. You know, own the clinic, um, put safety measurement there to try to protect you and it's safe to go to the clinic to see the, your physician. So I highly encourage people to follow up with their uh, chronic care management just to decrease their chance of being in the hospital. What do you, what's like the one uh, non-COVID thing that you're seeing the most of at the clinic level, Doc? Yeah, I tell you, a big part of it is stress. Um, Chris, I mean, we, Jake and um, Sabrina, and we, we see a lot of people that have a lot of depression, a lot of stress, and, and uh, we, we somehow have to tackle that one. You know, it's, um, uh, a lot of people still don't have a job, and, and they really stress out on meet every day, um, need that they have for their family. Uh, and that uh, really exacerbate their the blood pressure and the diabetes. So that's what the main uh, thing we're looking for is elevated blood pressure and poor control diabetes. So people are stressing yeah. and they're depressed. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, healthy diet is not cheap. And you know, well, when we are low on 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 funds, you know, the 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 bad food is the cheapest one. So uh, that doesn't help the chronic care management. Wow, Doc. How could we and better? We got, I, I mean, and, maybe. and you know, the, the only thing that we, I really like um, um, public health and, and put a message out a whole lot is that, um, you know, we are now in February, right? So we start our immunization in December of, um 2020 right so a lot of our people a lot of elderly remember the high priority is the one that get the first two months uh, when the immunization started um and quite a few of them i would say more than 50 percent or more of those high comorbidity and elderly that have their complete their shot in december and, and january of last year, just remind that we are one year out. If you don't have your booster at uh, this time, uh, you are considered a very high risk just because um, the efficacy of the vaccine uh, regarding the prevention of uh, getting symptomatic infection and also prevention of hospitalization are way down. Uh, you are a year out. So I think that if you don't have the booster, um, uh, we need to remind them that, remember, they over one year already. So they have to have the booster as soon as possible with the Omicron because it's so infectious. So um, I know we don't track, I never hear anyone talk about it, but the remember the elderly get the first shot uh, in December and January, yep. and they are out already. Yeah. So uh, we we have to get them in to get the booster, and, and we need to really push that message because if not those elderly and high comorbid comorbidity patients will end up in the hospital soon. Yep, I got my booster jingle. I'm just waiting for public health to give me a call. <laughs> one one year out, guys. That's a long time already. It is, Doc. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, that's some good good uh, way to close this conversation. Appreciate your time this morning, Doc. You're welcome, guys. Just be safe and practice 3W. And, and again, you know, if you have uh, 
uh, symptom, go get checked. If you have, um, if you're positive, remember, do not count the day your symptoms start. Count the day you turn positive. But ask for the safety for yourself, your family, and your coworker. So um, please count the day that you turn positive as day zero and count five days out. Thank you, Doc. Okay? Got it. No, Appreciate it, Be Doctor. Uh, you too, Doc. Be safer. Uh, Seven forty-seven, Monday, February seventh. Let's uh, go to the phones here. I know we had this 